Okay, we are right at 4.05, so I'm going to get started. Hello and welcome everyone to a digital native publishing format research modules presented by Chris Harbering from, the Liberate, from Liberate Science. My name is Cynthia Tindongan and I'll be your moderator for the next 40 minutes. A quick reminder before we begin, during the presentation portion, please uh, keep your audio and video muted. Feel free to use the Q&A tab to post questions, and I will try to keep track of those. You can navigate to other sessions by clicking the desired session in the hop-in schedule or click the left-hand sidebar links. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, for Chris, it's this evening. and. Um, uh, we're delighted to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thanks for joining uh, in this session here at the US ETDA. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to, to be here. Um, I did turn on automated transcribing, but I'm not 100% sure if it's showing up in the screen share. Um, Cynthia, do you see at the bottom, um, automated subtitles. Okay, seems like that's not coming through, so I'm just going to disable it. I'm yeah, very sorry I, about that. I have heard that that's a little bit of a problem, Chris. I'm not seeing any um, transcription happening. Okay, then um, I'll leave that off. Um, I'm very sorry if. Uh, for the people who are hard of hearing, um, I hope that uh, I'll, I'll be sharing these slides afterwards also. Um, so uh, I hope that if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Um, my apologies for not having transcription uh, with this. Um, oh, is it coming across? Sorry, it's showing up very... Um, Badly here, my screen share on my end. Yeah, there's something uh, wonky going on there. Okay, then I'm just gonna stop it and I'm gonna reshare. This is always a fantastic start. Um, so thank you for your patience. So um, I'm Chris Heikrink, as Cynthia so kindly introduced me. I'm the founder and uh, director of the Berlin-based startup Liberate Science. And today I'm here about to talk about research modules. Um, a new publishing format. Uh, so before I get started, uh, a bit, I want to share a bit more about myself because uh, uh, I definitely realize that I'm a bit out of my usual space. So I'm a researcher myself by training uh, and my background is in social psychology, applied statistics, and I did my PhD in meta research or more commonly known as science and technology studies, uh, where I really focus uh, on how to improve how we do science and uh, in order to really uh, provide more reliable and reproducible results. Um, and I really came of age during the so-called reproducibility crisis um, as these issues started coming to light in 2011 when I was uh, just ending my, my bachelor's and uh, starting my master's degree and uh, um, I used to be a research assistant to, to a psychologist who ended up being one of the biggest frauds. So that was also definitely uh, a, a realization moment that something was wrong, both at a local level and, and broader. And one of the real key findings of my dissertation was that the publishing system is really a massive bottleneck uh, for any change that we want to uh, that we want to create uh, within the scholarly publishing or the reproducibility system. Um, so if also after the talk, uh, you know, some ideas that come up uh, that, that I, uh, fr from what I talk about here, uh, please do not feel limited to just the Q&A right now, but uh, also always feel free to reach out after um, with my handle chartgrink or uh, on Twitter or my email. Um, and I really want to get started here by taking a step back uh, for a moment. And this this graph from a from a recent publication, um, I think, is, is is a very nice one. It talks a bit about all the various improvements in 
uh, in scientific publishing that have come up uh, through articles, but also uh, theses and uh, dissertations. And it talks about these things such as uh, data sharing, code sharing, uh, conflicts of interest, protocol registration, replication. And in my bubble, I don't know whether this is the same in your bubble, uh, but I, it's very often that we think we're doing incredibly well on uptake for these practices. So that data sharing, we keep seeing it more and more, code sharing, replication. So yes, we're doing really well. Um, and sometimes my colleagues who are also statisticians um, who always like to look at the data, we sometimes also forget that, uh, that we need to have empirical evidence. And when we look at this, um, there are some domains where, where it's um, promising, things like funding disclosure and the conflict of interest disclosure. But when we look at something like the code sharing or the protocol registration, we're really only on track to maybe achieve this by the year uh, 20, 2100 and when the world is also going to be many more degrees um, hotter than it is now on average. So yes, we might see absolute numbers increasing, but we shouldn't forget that if, for example, we achieve a 5% increase in code sharing in 2020 compared to 2019, um, that the 8.9% increase in publications actually means that we are ending up with fewer publications that include code than the year before. So because the amount of publications is growing much faster than the amount of publications with code, it means that the gap is actually uh, becoming bigger. And why am I sharing this right now is uh, really to highlight this point that we're now in this exponential time of publishing. There's ever more information being produced. So that means that in order to really start changing um, start changing the system, that change also needs to pick up the pace much, much faster. Uh, so the point there being that reform isn't really an option anymore in this exponential age, both for changing how and what we publish, um, and as a side note, uh, also not for the climate crisis. So for a substantial change, we need to substantially change what we do and what the system does, and pretty much saying we shouldn't keep adding duct tape um, but think about how to really uh, pretty much revolt within the system. And to analyze this, where is it going? There we go. Um, to get a better perspective on uh, how to actually uh, look at these issues and to really assess where we can improve and how to improve it. Uh, I really like this uh, this framework from the Library and Information Sciences, which uh, gives the uh, the scholarly communication or the publishing system five specific aims. Um, and this is incredibly important to help understand where the work needs to go. So the current publishing uh, system, uh, what does it aim to do and how does it fail at that? So I have these five functions. The first one, uh, is to register findings into the record. Then also to make sure those findings are archived, to certify the quality of those findings, raise awareness about those findings, and to incentivize or reward doing research. And at the moment, we know that the current publishing system fulfills these aims to a certain degree. The question is whether that is something we're satisfied with. Um, also in light of the amount of money that goes around in the publishing space. And I, for one, would argue that the state we're in right now is rather miserable um, and also uh, unacceptable, I would even say. So to sort of uh, indicate a bit of these issues here uh, specifically, where we could say, okay, you know, the, the system is fulfilling this function, but is it good enough? And so with registration, for example, uh, we can take a very narrow view and we can say, well, the findings that are published are registered. Uh, so, you know, yes, it is fulfilling that function, but we also know from ample research that there is highly selective publishing and not, not for good reasons, but also highly arbitrary ones um, where the quality is assessed to be worse 
uh, even though the methods are the same, when a study is not statistically significant um, and the chances of publication are higher when it is uh, statistically significant. So this selective publication uh, creates an issue within the registration function. Then another issue uh, here really with the archival um, that we see is that yes, uh, publications are archived, but in very select places with very select access. So these, is, these are what, call, what are called dark archives. It's, uh, it's like a vault. Um, only in certain events will those archives be triggered. Um, and the idea there being, yes, it fulfills this function, but um, if we take a wider interpretation of what is archival, one of the key uh, fundaments of any archival function is to make a lot of copies. And one of those things is with these dark archives that it actually prevents making a lot of copies. And this, uh, this you could argue either way. I'm not necessarily saying you should have one or the other opinion. My personal opinion is, is that a wider interpretation would be better for the publishing system. And then also with respect to certification, um, we see something similar. Yes, we have peer review in place as a certification procedure to make sure that there's a certain amount of quality. Um, we can discuss the issues of peer review also, uh, but I think one of the things I want to highlight is if we take a wider perspective on certification is also that we want provenance of results, provenance, provenance of research findings. So really to understand the origins um, of research findings. Then there's the issue of awareness. Yes, publishing helps to raise awareness, but there's the wider interpretation where publishing doesn't really promote access. It's increasing now, uh, but also with that, uh, it's going to take a while with the current trends before we actually reach complete access. And then with respect to rewards, yes, the current publishing system of articles has a reward function through bean counting of publications or citations. Um, but we can also ask, is that, uh, is that narrow interpretation sufficient? Uh, could we take a wider interpretation where we can actually reward and incentivize in a much more healthy manner uh, to really nurture uh, good research and good careers? And then we, we, we really come to this issue, this core issue that if anything within this publishing space right now Whenever we want to improve on any of these points, we, we have to go through ever more consolidated uh, publishing spaces. So here you see a graph uh, from uh, a publication from 2016, I think, from uh, uh, La Riviere, where they analyzed how many publications get published by um, publishers. And we see that within the field of social sciences, that there's actually almost around, in some cases, even more than 70% of all the publications come from five, uh, five publishers. So, and we see this drastic increase over the decades. So a researcher um, can improve their, their work all they want, but if the publications don't recognize that, um, their career won't either, and they will either have to adapt to the rules of the game uh, which promote worse quality research or leave academia altogether. And of course, there are edge cases, uh, but the, uh, the research really indicates that if you play the game well, you do a lot of small sample size studies, get some, get, uh, some nice innovative, uh, innovative results um, that end up not replicating. That's, that's how the game has been played over the past few decades. But we see that the past few decades has also come with this consolidation. So, um, so we would really have to go through these major publishers, these major institutions to make any change. And that's increasingly difficult also because big institutions are harder to change. And to sort of illustrate also this issue of selective publication, imagine 100 studies that are conducted by the researchers. So these are, this is all the work that we would want to register, um, that we would want to archive, certify, that we would want to raise awareness about, and that we would want to reward to 
a certain degree, you can also say negative rewards in that sense for, for uh, insufficient quality. But because of the exclusivity of journals and the page limits and the innovativeness and other reasons, only a subset of these even gets published. So this is what we would be able to see at the other end, right? So a few studies might be um, of insufficient quality, but most of the work can be, uh, for now, assumed to be uh, at least of uh, decent quality. And then, so if we pick out one of these, uh, this subset that has been published of this larger subset of papers that, um, uh, that has been conducted, um, then we see that, you know, it's been certified by peer review, it has a DOI, and we have certain expectations of it. So we read this paper, there's this narrative in there, and we see this result. And then this question starts arising, right? Because this is the core of how we publish uh, articles, theses, or uh, dissertations. And dissertations, this might be a chapter in that sense. But then we get this question of, um, as I mentioned before, where do these findings come from? And behind every paper, there's a, a story in that sense of how the research uh, was actually conducted. So we might, in an empirical setting, have you know, the standard uh, empirical cycle where you start out with your theory, you move on to your predictions, then you create study materials through, uh, you collect data around it, code results, and so on. And that might be perfectly represented, um, the, the paper might tell a story, and that might be the, the story uh, the origins of that story. But we cannot at the moment discern whether this happens or whether something else happens. Um, so in, in my field, this is often called p-hacking or hypothesizing after results are known, where you go through the research cycle and by the time you get to the results, you figure out, oh, I forgot, you know, I forgot a certain covariate uh, in my analyses, of course that should have been part of my predictions. And it's very easy to then uh, take this shortcut unconsciously and update the prediction, but that invalidates uh, the results to a certain degree. If it's presented as a story that's nice and linear in that sense, uh, we'll see later that this behavior in and of itself doesn't need to be problematic. Um, but we don't know because within an article, like in this situation, we're sort of like trying to see through what the article actually is presenting, where the origins of those um, of this these findings or that story comes from. But we can't see it because the paper isn't transparent. It's just that story. Um, so that is why we're reintroducing um, research modules. So I might have been a bit. Uh, exaggerated that we are introducing it in the in the abstract because it's actually not a new idea. It's uh, it's from a, from uh, some researchers from Elsevier from the late '90s where they proposed let's let's publish research in these independent units that can be used to uh, construct um, larger pathways of research. So I, I like to compare it a bit to Lego blocks of research. You have different bits and pieces, and you can build. Uh, you can build findings from those. Um, and those, uh, those modules, these, these building blocks, they does, don't even need to be text per se, because in this digital age, we can really conceptualize one module as simply being a container where we can put information in. And that information may take the shape of text in a theory, for example, but it can also take the, inf uh, take the shape of data or code or maybe even uh, videos of a study protocol, for example, or pretty much anything you can uh, imagine. Uh, and taking this idea of research modules and creating those and constructing those within a digital space allows us to really create a vast array of these modules um, that contain all kinds of information that are created in the research process. And these modules can then become very helpful uh, in deconstructing the article. So articles or theses or dissertations, um, they always pre present some 
some studies, for example, or some, some findings. And each of these, uh, I'll, I'll assume for, for the sake of the argument here that it's one uh, quantitative study, but uh, you can also have other research processes. So each study represents a research process each process is composed of multiple steps in the research, and the order of those steps is incredibly important uh, to understand the origins. And each step produces information in some form. So you might, you probably already see where I'm going with this, is that each step in the research gets its own module. So that we, with, with the information we produce in each step, we have one output in that sense. And remember this, what I showed before, if we could see through the paper where the narrative is shared, where the story is told, and that we would be able to actually see uh, the, the origins, the research process, it might look something like this. It might look like this, uh, this neat uh, empirical cycle. So we could then take a look, um, on the left is this idealized version, uh, but we could then subsequently in a research module sense, we could start out by publishing uh, a theory on its own um, as a module, then move on to publish a prediction and link that back to the theory. So if we would now only, like we would stop there, we would then be able to say, okay, these predictions, they originate from this theory. But we can keep building on these research modules. So in this scenario, we might add a research module for study materials, link that back to the prediction, and keep going with more and more modules all the way to, for example, a discussion here, but we could also keep adding additional ones um, as our research keeps going along because there isn't a clear delineation between one research process and the next, because it's also very often one big research process. But so if we would then subsequently, for example, see these results and we'd be interested, hey, where do these come from? We would be able to trace back the origins and we could see the code and keep going back up um, the path to see, hey, where does this come from? And with these research modules, each would get their own separate uh, DOI. So you would actually be able to point very spe specifically to one step in a, in a research process. And then if you would want, you could still collect all of these steps and then subsequently say, you know, I'm gonna write a story, a narrative around this and publish that as a paper uh, or a thesis or a dissertation. But then if we would move on to, for example, a bit more, uh, a less idealized version of an empirical cycle, um, then we wouldn't be able to see this within the paper uh, very easily. This, is a, this would often be a nonlinear story in that sense, um, where we actually go from a theory to predictions, and then we realize, hey, something, something's up with the theory. This, this doesn't make sense, so we actually wanna backtrack and go and update the theory again and create new predictions and then uh, create our study based on that. And that would be very difficult to share in a linear uh, storytelling fashion, but within a research module space, that would be a continuation of the research process because that's in essence what it is. So we would again publish a theory, publish prediction, both get DOI, but then instead of uh, immediately going to the materials as we went, as we did before, we actually create another updated theory module, which we can then uh, neatly link back to the prediction. So the, the origins of this updated theory are actually also much clearer. Um, and then we can continue through, uh, for example, this, this neat cycle. And this is very idealized, of course. But then, sort of going one step further, where we previously saw this, what I called a shortcut or what's called p-hacking uh, within the paper space, because this, this update from the results to the hypotheses is actually, there's no space for that to happen within the article because it's such a, uh, 
such a linear narrative and this story that's being told, if we would represent this in a research module space, we would start publishing each step of our research as a module, and the process could just continue up to the results. And then these updated predictions are also a next step in the research process. So we can actually understand where uh, what happens in this process, because if we publish all of these steps as we go through the research process, not just at the very end after the fact, uh, we, can, we can see how the research develops, which contains also a lot of valuable information uh, for other researchers trying to understand findings and where they come from. Might be a bit less neat uh, in, in terms of story, but just like books provide us with a narrative across articles, articles can still provide us with a narrative across uh, many research modules. So research modules can be really helpful to break free from the limitations of an article in that sense, when it, it's not in this idealized form of a regular empirical cycle. And then, you know, in this specific scenario, we haven't even talked about who publishes these. So we might imagine that this is one person, but we can also imagine uh, many modules being published by different people within one research process. So in this specific scenario, you see that uh, three different people publish different bits and pieces of uh, a research process. So with this, we would even be able to make research work more specialized if people would want to. And we could recognize contributions of various people across research modules within one larger research project or research process. So that we could also really allow people, I, for example, love building big databases and analyzing these and providing the code for, for, uh, for analysis. And that's really where also my expertise lies. I'm not that good in building up theories and predictions and creating study designs. So I'd be very, very grateful if I could collaborate with somebody and rec let, let that work also be recognized uh, for them and that I would be recognized for the work with respect to building these databases and, and this code. And this would be incredibly helpful to reduce this pressure on uh, on researchers and especially early career researchers, I would argue, um, to be specialists in everything because that's quite the high demand. Um, so in that sense, research modules might help to, uh, to also improve the working conditions in that sense. So as a recap, um, research articles, if they are a storytelling approach to publishing and what we're proposing based on this, uh, this paper from the late 90s and later work is to take a process-based approach to publishing so that it's research process instead of research storytelling. Um, and these modules, they can be text, code, data, or other information holders. Um, and that, that really has a sense of creating Lego blocks of research and the more blocks there are, the more creative also the outputs can be. So what now? This is all a nice, uh, nice story in its in and of itself, of course. Um, but uh, this is not just something that is uh, a story. Uh, so we've been experimenting with researchers on a practical practical implementation of this over the last year. Um, after we've been developing these ideas for the past four years, um, partly funded by the Mozilla Science Lab and we'll be launching a publishing platform uh, for this for research modules on February 1st, uh, where every individual can sign up and publish research modules open access for free. Um, so if you would like to stay informed about this, um, I'll drop a link in the chat in a moment uh, where you can sign up for the newsletter so you can stay up to date. Um, and also if this might be of interest to explore options to introduce this form of publishing uh, with your department, students, or other constituents. I'm always happy to set up a meeting to discuss that further. Um, I'll also drop a link in the chat where you can just uh, slide into my, my, my calendar. Um, 
for a quick chat about that. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time. I hope that it's, uh, it's a bit of a more amenable time for you, uh, but I'm still very grateful that, to get this time slot and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing any questions, concerns, or, um, or any other thoughts, to be honest. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That was really, really interesting, compelling. I'm afraid that some of it was um, beyond me, <laughs> but I'm really, I'm really excited to learn about what you're doing. It, it's, it, it strikes me as I know cutting edge is kind of a, a pat thing to say, but that really does strike me as what you're doing. Uh, Thank and you very much. I'm hearing that in the chat also. Um, John wanted to make sure that you knew that this your your presentation will eventually be posted on YouTube with um, captioning. Ah, thank you. So that's it that's will fantastic. Be available with captioning, and also I have a few questions. But uh, there's also one from John who is who's no longer here. He had to go to a another meeting. Um, he's asking if you're familiar with the um, NDLTD. NDLTD. It's the Networked Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations. No, I, I'm not familiar with the NTD. It's NDLTD. It's in the Q&A. Um, okay. And there's a, there's a URL there. Um, they, are, they are having a conference, a symposium coming up. Um, and um, John is recommending that maybe you consider presenting or um, publishing in their, their um, e-journal. That uh, sounds like a good idea. I'll definitely check that out. Thanks, John, even though you're not here anymore. Right. So because I'm really a beginner at, at what you were talking about, I'm interested in a couple of things. One of them is what you talked about, five publishing houses. Um, that The implications of that seem to me to be grave to creative um, research from a diverse perspectives and worldviews and, you know, just having this really small, limited way to get your work out there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dutch by origin, so I feel like just the, the colonial history is already very rich, but the aspect of um, that these are British, Dutch, or American houses that, you know, sort of, quote unquote, rule the world, um, I think so that's, the world. yeah, that's, that's definitely an issue. And I think that one of the key tenets for me is always uh, researcher control so that the researcher can decide and consent to what's happening. And my personal experiences also were that, um, you know, I, 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 we, we had a paper with some formulas in it and it was uh, typeset and all of a sudden superscripts became subscripts and like completely m changing the meaning of things. And what and it happened to some of my colleagues also and it took away that autonomy and i think that's one of the things that we see happening a lot also in terms of diversity and inclusion where you know the english language it's so familiar to so many of us in the western world but at the same time uh, there's also so much more and this the nurturing not just allowing it and tolerating it but really nurturing these other ways of knowing is incredibly important. So autonomy uh, for researchers to really publish what they want, when they want to, um, is for me very important in the language they want, because I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing the kind of work that's being done in, in the African continent that, mm -hmm. that they don't get the opportunity to publish and be recognized for within their own institutions because the expectation is publish in high impact factor journals, which are primarily in the English language. Um, so lack of yeah. recognition and respect for indigenous knowledge and the ways yes. that it gets that the ways that it gets reproduced and performed. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and and we we have this manifesto where we say um, where we're. we're it's all about knowledge trademark instead of like multiple forms of knowing. Thank you. That's really interesting. So you talked about publishing being arbitrary and selective. Can you tell me more about that? Tell us more about that. Yeah. So this is very, um, 
a famous paper in my field from uh, this man named Mahoney, um, where he did an experiment with um, uh, with uh, with results, and it was exactly the same paper, the same methods, except that the results were, you know, either they were, you know, uh, yes, we found an effect, um, or it said, uh, no, we didn't find an effect. And it was the reviewers evaluated the studies that found effects as being of much higher quality um, than, than the, the ones that didn't find effects. And, and notes, uh, not finding an effect can be in that sense, we didn't find a difference between the placebo and the drug condition on side effects, which is a very positive thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so that that kind of arbitrariness in terms of the human aspect of evaluating research um, is definitely something that uh, that comes to mind and. It reminds me also of, of these studies that happen with respect to um, like resumes and job applications where they switch out only the name and then if it's a bit more of a, uh, of a foreign name, all of a sudden mm -hmm. acceptance rates plummet and that kind of arbitrariness and how do we ensure that, that we don't fall prey to, to these kinds of human biases in that sense. And we're not often thinking about them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question. Deborah, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like me to? Feel free to uh, unmute and, um, and turn your video on if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, I will go ahead. Um, and she asks, I can see how this would be a great novel platform for established researchers. How would this type of publishing model translate to dissertations for our students? Great question. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that from my own dissertation work, um, it would really be about uh, being able to manage and track your own work better. Um, so that by the time that you have to create your chapters, all the documentation is already there. And you can also point towards all the supporting materials that, that you've uh, already sort of, the breadcrumbs you've already created for yourself. Um, so in that sense, I think that this isn't a way to publish your whole dissertation per se, um, but it's more about f collecting all the, the tidbits that go in there and uh, having, that, uh, having that path be, uh, be available to you. So documentation in that sense. Um, but this is, uh, this is definitely something where uh, also the practice of this is incredibly important, which is also why I invite, uh, if, you, if you have people who might want to be interested to work through these things, to, to let me know, because I think that um, it is completely different. So uh, there's still much to learn, and this is not the end, because when something is introduced, new problems come up, and we want to really be in this dialogue to continuously figure out because we, we we're building this we have we we're not a big uh, publisher and we have the the adaptability to really be like you need x to do your research better well we we can work with you on actually making this happen uh, within a few months so to speak well that sounds wonderful um we are down to just a couple of minutes left um that's just um Continuing along Deborah's question, it, it seems like even though it's completely different from the way our students are trained to, to research and write and publish, that this is a great uh, sort of model to start at the beginning of, as you said, an early career researcher. Yeah, and at the end, you could sort of see your whole history evolve and how you're sort of creating your own tree or web of knowledge in that sense. Not, not to refer to web of knowledge, the database. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we are just about out of time um, and we are out of questions. Uh, how would you like to, anything you'd like to close with? Oh, actually there is a question. There is another question oh. if you don't mind. No, that uh, sounds good. Um, Emily um, asks, uh, data management and digital accessibility are important factors now with research. How are you addressing both of these? And I'm afraid you're not going to have a lot of time to do that. 
Well, in that sense, I think that uh, these are new new issues where also adding tools is very important. Uh, there's many ways how to interpret this, uh, like various uh, things. And I think that um, having uh, a dynamic approach is actually um, might be able to solve some of these issues better. But Emily, I'm happy to chat more uh, in DMs or something. Uh, so Cynthia, thank you for moderating. I, that's something I want to say. So. Well, Chris, um, we were delighted to uh, to hear your presentation, and I really look forward to hearing more from you and mm -hmm. more from Liberate Science. So thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye. See you around.